Have you ever used uh, Open Table, the reservation service? If you have, let me see your hands. A few of you? Not as many as I thought. Okay, so probably less than 10% have used Open Table. I, Robin and I have used it in the past, and if you're not familiar with Open Table, it's a, a reservation service. They help you find uh, reservations at your favorite restaurant. The company was started right here in the, the San Francisco Bay Area. It's over 20 years old. They have a point system and a points program where, where you can you know, get free meals and free hotels and, and different things like that. But, but ironically, I've actually got on there and looked up a reservation and the table wasn't open, the table was closed. The restaurant said no, that they were booked for the evening. And so a little contrary to their name, two weeks ago we taught on the Lord's table. And we said that the Lord's table is always, say always, it's always open. And, and the Lord's table is symbolic of the work that Jesus Christ did when he died on a cross 2,000 years ago and the invitation that he has given to every single person in the entire world to join him, to join him around his table, to join his family, to join him in fellowship. And then from there what he does is he challenges us as a church to open our table to open our hearts, our lives, and even our homes to invite people in. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 14, and we're going to uh, read a story about Jesus going over to, to somebody's house to eat. And, and, and what I love about the Gospels, what I love about, about the Bible, is how often it talks about Jesus eating food. So sometimes the, the way I hear some Christians talk, Jesus is just this kind of quasi-supernatural spiritual being, but, but when he walked on this planet, he was fully human. He was alive. He engaged in eating and went to feasts. His first miracle was at a wedding feast. His, his favorite picture of heaven was, was the great banquet in the sky someday. And he told us in, in John chapter 6 that if anybody comes to him, you will never be hungry. And so Jesus correlates our, our spiritual hunger and thirst, our spiritual quest, to our physical hunger and thirst and our physical quest. And we're going to dive into that just a little bit today in Luke chapter 14. This is what it says. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. And there in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. So when he noticed how the guest picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this story. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends. Don't invite your brothers or your sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
help us to understand this story because it, it seems contradictory to the way life really works. It seems different from many of the experiences that we've had uh, here in this church. So I pray, Father God, that you'd help us to understand the, the deeper truths. I pray that you'd open up our minds to the realities of hospitality and that you'll, you'll teach us by your spirit, Father God, what it is that you'd have each and every one of us to do. I pray this today. I believe this in Jesus' holy and precious name. And together everyone says, amen. I remember, I think I was a senior in high school and uh, I remember taking home economics. And this was, this was back in the day when, when boys didn't take home economics. So just one friend of mine and I, we were alone in the class uh, with 30 other girls. We were the smart ones back then, just so you know, okay? But one of the lessons was etiquette. They actually taught us how to set a table. They taught us that, that while you're eating, you're not supposed to put your, your elbows on the table. These were, these were the table manners. They, they taught us that, that when you uh, wipe your mouth with your napkin, you're supposed to take it out of your lap and just take a, a corner of the napkin and, and, and kind of dab it. You don't just smash it all over your face. They, they taught us that, that we know that you're 17-year-old young men, but you're not supposed to belch or burp at the table. And that was extremely challenging for us. Uh, especially in home ex economics classes. We were, we were taught not to, to chew and, and talk at the same time, and we were taught how to, how to use the, the salad fork with the salad and the entree fork with the entree and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, and so in Jesus' day, there were certain rules that were in force when you were invited over to somebody's house. And, and so in that day, the upper crust would eat with the upper crust, and, and the lower crust would, would eat with the lower crust, and the two never mixed. So, so Jesus gets this invitation from this prominent Pharisee, the Scripture says. And, and so, so Jesus wants to teach the Pharisees and he wants to teach us today that the rules that sometimes our culture lays upon us are not the rules that God wants us to enforce. And so the first rule that, that Jesus shares with us is the rule that, that the table is a place where you accept everybody. Would you say everybody? Everybody. And, and, and here's where it's really interesting because some people in religious circles really focus on the poor. And they say, you know what? We need to take care of the poor. We need to honor the poor. We need to be with the poor. And, and they almost villainize the rich. But Jesus in this story is telling us that everyone is invited to his table. The poor are invited and the rich are invited. That's why he accepts an invitation to have dinner at, at the house of a prominent Pharisee. We're talking about one of the leaders, one of the wealthiest guys. And, and based upon this story, you can tell that there's probably a reception going on right now. And, and Jesus is, is, is offering an olive branch to this particular Pharisee because in the previous chapter they got in a big debate with a leader in the, in the temple over healing on the Sabbath. And so in Jesus' mind, he's thinking, okay, here's a prominent guy uh, in the temple. He's, he's a Pharisee. He's one of the leaders of the people. I'm going to go and try and, and, you know, make a peace treaty. I'm going to go and try and, and offer this olive branch. I, I have good intentions of making this work. But when Jesus shows up, the scripture shows that he's actually been set up. That the Pharisee does not have good motives in any way, shape, or form. Although Jesus accepts the upper crust, he also shows us that, that this man who's invited here, uh, let's read, read it for more in, in the scripture. Uh, verse 1 says, he was being carefully watched. Jesus shows up with good intention, but the Pharisees are, are lurking they're actually kind of, kind of watching for him to misstep, to make a mistake, to do something wrong. And according to their table manners, remember, if some guy is sick in Jewish culture back then, that meant that he had sinned. 
that he had done something wrong and, and that you can't associate with that person and you definitely can't heal them on the Sabbath. That's one of their cultural religious rules at that time. So they're spying to see how Jesus is going to face this man who has an abnormal swelling in his body. If you've got a King James Bible or, or an, another translation, it might say that he has the dropsy. And so what it's really referring to is maybe it's a kidney ailment. Maybe it's, it's congestive heart uh, disease of some kind. And what ends up happening is, is you can't uh, process liquids in your body very well. So, so your face begins to swell. Your arms begin to swell. Even your torso and your legs begin to swell. And, and so the Pharisees are just watching what's Jesus going to do. But understand, they must have invited him. The only way he gets to this party, to this feast, to this banquet, is someone had to have invited him with the purpose of setting Jesus up. So, so, so the bottom line here is, is that Jesus, first of all, accepts the prominent, the rich, but he also accepts this man who is diseased. This man who is broken, this, this man who is seen as insignificant, rejected by culture, an outcast of, of some kind. And, and, and what Jesus tries to do is he tries to open up a dialogue because he lets us understand that the table is for conversation. The table is where we can get to know each other. The table, if it's, if it's a, a healthy table environment, it includes telling our stories. When you sit down around a table, don't you often sit, tell people where you're from, what you do, what's happened in your life? It's the telling of our individual stories. That's what takes place around a table. At my house, Robin and I have a two-story house. She tells her story and I tell my story, which isn't always the, the same story. But listen, listen, listen. The table's the best place to tell stories. When you're sitting around, especially a round table, you see everybody face to face. Sitting around a, a campfire with, with marshmallows or hot dogs in the flame, it's a great place to tell campfire stories. Going to Starbucks or Pete's or Phil's and, and sitting down around a table with another person one on one, it is the perfect place to tell your story. You know what saddens me? is right now I get these alerts anytime somebody on Facebook updates their story. And it saddens me that people are trying to communicate their story via technology. They're trying to communicate their story on Instagram. And, and the story they often communicate isn't even an authentic one. It's, it's, it's filled with exaggeration or lies or, 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 or misrepresentations of some kind. And, and what saddens me the most is, is we don't have the, the opportunities around the table where we can look people in the eye and communicate our story. Because you are a story wrapped in flesh and your story is most appropriately told around a table. And if you're a, a Christian, if you are a true follower of God, your story is way bigger than you. Your, your story is really about Jesus Christ. Your story is really about the history of the world and how God has reconnected with humanity because he loves everybody. Say everybody. He loves everybody. And he wants everyone to be a part of his story. Your story becomes your testimony. That's what we call it in Christian circles. So if a healthy table involves storytelling, a healthy table also involves truth-telling. And a lot of people in our culture today tell us that there are no absolute truths. But then I would argue with them, how are you ever going to build a building if there are no absolute truths? If two plus two isn't for yesterday, today, and forever, then we're going to be in a lot of trouble. But we know mathematically there are absolute truths. That teaches us that relationally there are absolute truths, that spiritually there are absolute truths. And so, so one of our jobs as human beings is to discover them, find them, what is the absolute truth, and then begin to communicate it. What I really think is interesting about the New Testament 
is that the word truth uh, in the Greek language is aletheia, and it comes from the root to come out of hiding. And so when I think of that, that phrase to come out of hiding, I actually think of the story of Adam and Eve. I, I think of, of the story of where they sin all the way back in Genesis chapters 2 and 3 and 4, that, that story. And, and then what do they do? They immediately go into hiding. Well, what they do is they cover themselves with leaves and, and, and then they go into the woods or trees somewhere because God shows up on the scene and it says he calls out to them, uh, Adam, where are you? And so when I, when I think of this story, let me, let me tell you three relational untruths that we need to realize when it comes to the table. Untruth number one is this, God is our enemy. Isn't that what Adam and Eve thought? The reason why they were running away from God, the reason why they covered themselves, the reason why they, they hid was they thought that God was going to punish them, kill them, destroy them, judge them immediately. What they didn't understand is how much God really loved them. Who can say amen to that? I mean, God loved them so much that he said, he said you know what, you, you do deserve to be, to be destroyed, but I, I have a plan. And the plan is I'm going to sacrifice this animal and cover you, uh, symbolically covering your sin, uh, speaking prophetically that someday I'm going to make provision that your sins can be forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. God is not your enemy. God is your friend. He loves you. He desires that you be a part of his family. Untruth number two is this, that it's unsafe to be authentic in front of other people. That, that's really what, what we get from, from Adam and Eve hiding. They're thinking that if we really expose ourselves to God, if we let God see who we really are and what it is that we've done, that he'll be so disappointed in us that he won't want us any longer. But God took the exact opposite point of view, the exact opposite stand. And he said, although what you have done is ugly and, and your sin has, has separated you from me, I'm going to work throughout the history of humanity to bring mankind back into the fold, to bring mankind back into the family and make you sons and daughters the way I had originally planned. Who can say amen to that? And untruth number three is that I'm better off alone. Isn't that what Adam said when, when God said, uh, who told you to eat of, of the fruit of that tree? And Adam said, well, the woman you gave me. In other words, in one phrase, he throws God under the bus and he throws his wife under the bus. And he basically says, I can do this without you and I can do this without the woman. And God had already communicated in chapter two, it is not good for man to live alone. We were created for community. We were created for a table. We were created to sit down across a table, eat together, talk together, discover each other, share our, our good days, our bad days, our good traits, our bad traits, and become honest and authentic with other human beings and live in community in Jesus' name. Now here's what's really interesting is truth is not just propositional. Truth is a person. Jesus says, I am the way and the, the truth. I am the way and the truth. He is the truth. God sent us truth wrapped in skin. God sent us the truth in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and for, for 33 or thereabout years, he was trying to communicate who he was. He was trying to communicate what God wanted from us. He was trying to communicate how to reconnect with God. And then, and then at the end of his life, and we're about to celebrate Easter, he died on this cross. He was in the tomb for parts of three days and then he was resurrected from from the dead and the bible says he spent 40 more days on this planet so what was he doing for those 40 days he was revealing more truth about himself there's a story in luke chapter 24 where he's walking down the road to emmaus and he comes in contact with two of his disciples and they don't recognize him they're so discouraged and so despondent that, that he comes up and he says, oh, what's going on? And they go, haven't you heard? 
Our Lord and Savior, our Messiah, has, has been killed, has been crucified, he's dead. And the Bible tells us over the next couple of verses that Jesus starts pulling out from the Old Testament certain prophecies about him, about the Messiah. And, and they end up going on into a home and they sit down and listen to what the scripture says in Luke 24, 30 and 31. When he was at the table with them, it's not until they get to the table that things really start happening. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. If you really want to have a revelation as to who somebody is, no matter how different they are from you, you need to sit down and eat with them at a table. You need to break bread with them. And in that environment, you have an opportunity to really get a revelation as to who somebody else is. So in verses 3 and 4, Jesus asks the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. I would think that Jesus would probably have preferred to talk about the weather. I'm sure Jesus would have preferred to talk about uh, March Madness and, and how uh, uh, Virginia, who got knocked out as a number one seed last year by a 16 seed, has, has somewhat redeemed themselves and made it all the way back to the championship game this year. And, and he would have loved to have done some, some surface talk here, but he had to hit them with truth right out of the chute. They weren't willing to listen to a story, so, so Jesus had to correct the bad manners. And, and so he says, hey, is it lawful, is it legal to heal somebody? Is it right to do good on the Sabbath day? And the reason he's saying this is because he's trying to explain in verse 4 that the table is a place of healing so, so he takes hold of the man, the scripture says, and he heals him and he sends him on his way. I find that so interesting that, that Jesus does exactly what the Pharisees wanted him to do because it was against their rules. They wanted to bust Jesus because you can't heal on the Sabbath. It's one of our religious rules. And, and Jesus is saying, wait, wait, wait a minute. Relationships are the table priority. It's way more important than the etiquette, than the rules. Restoration requires an environment where, where there is safety. And so this man needs to be restored. When you get around a table, it's about restoring relationships. It's about healing individuals. It's about bringing a, a new relationship and building things there. That The table is, is not just a place where you say grace. It's a place where you extend grace. Who can say amen to that? You extend grace at the table. So what does Jesus do? He, he holds this man. That's what the Bible says. He embraces him. The embrace always comes before the truth. You see, if you don't accept somebody first, your truth is meaningless to them. You have to show them that you love them. You have to show them that you value them. You have to show them that you actually see them as, as the image of, of God himself. And then the Bible says he healed him. And, and then it's really interesting. The scripture says that, that he protects this man by sending him home away from the bullies who are the Pharisees. Why is it the religious people are often the worst bullies? And I'm talking about every faith there is. They oftentimes become the, the biggest bullies. They think they, they have all the truth and, and they bully people with their knowledge. I remember the cafeteria table from when I was a kid. I, I grew up and I was always abnormally small. I was the shortest boy in my class from, from about kindergarten all the way through ninth grade. And, and I was always the shortest. And I remember sitting at the, at the table in fifth grade at the lunch table with people coming by and turning my, my lunch over or stealing my food. I remember deciding, you know what, it's better to eat on my own. So I'd take my 25 cents and I'd go to the Arctic Circle, which was right down the road. Anybody know what the Arctic Circle is? It was a McDonald's for people around the Arctic Circle, all right? I'm from South Dakota, so it was like a fast food restaurant. You could get three hamburgers for a quarter at one time. 
It was a long, 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 long time ago, just so you know. Okay? Yeah, eons ago. Another, another century, that's for sure. And, and, and so that's because the bullies bug me. Jesus said, I'm not going to let these bullies bug you. I'm going to send you home. I'm going to send you to some place safe. And, and so Jesus starts turning the tables on the Pharisees here. He, he's like, you know what? I'm going to take control of the situation. And Jesus had a tendency of doing that. He would always, whether he was invited or whether he did the inviting, he always acted as the host. He always made the determination that, that I'm going to take the lead. I'm going, to, I'm going to teach these people something. And so what he was basically saying is that the Pharisees or the religious leaders are selfish, angry, and self-righteous. And if you're truly a follower of Jesus Christ, you should be marked by, by different attitudes than that. You should actually be happy once in a while. You should be much more humble than that. And, and your life should be marked by hospitality. See, I, I've heard this, that hospitality is a lost art. But what Jesus is communicating here is that hospitality is a lost heart. He exposes the Pharisees' heart. And he basically calls them hypocrites. He says, you didn't invite me here because you're hospitable. You didn't invite the man with dropsy here because you're hospitable. In verses 5 and 6, look at what he says. He says, then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. Why? Because he's making a statement that's obviously true. If your son gets hurt on the Sabbath, will you not violate the rules of the Sabbath and do some work? And the answer was yes. Now, were they wrong in doing that? No, because there is a higher law even for the Jewish people than the law, and that higher law is the royal law of love. Jesus himself said, I can sum up all of the law in two commands, love God first and love your neighbor as yourself. That sums up all the law. So, so if you have to choose to follow a rule or show love, then you're supposed to show love above that particular rule. He goes on and, and, and he warns them. He says, hey, loving your family basically is not enough. You have to love strangers. You have to love the immigrant you have to love people who are a different color than you. You have to love people who don't act like you and don't think like you. And he takes it a step further. He says, what if your ox falls in? Now, now we're not farmers today, but basically what he's saying is, what if your car breaks down? Or, or what if your refrigerator goes out on the Sabbath day? Wouldn't you not fix it? And the answer is yes. And he's saying, why would you treat a piece of property better than you would treat a human being? You can't do that. Because all, say all, all human beings are created in the image of God. Every man, every woman, every child is an image bearer of God himself. So, so Jesus warns not to put stuff ahead of people because we're all made in his image. So, he exposes their hearts, and what their hearts are filled with is pride. It's really the, the basic sin of all humanity. It's the root sin of, of every other sin. And he exposes their pride. He, he says in verse 7, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them a story. And the point of the story is that motives matter. The point of the story is, is when you do something, even if it's something good, why are you really doing it? Are you doing it to highlight yourself or are you doing it to serve God and to serve your, your fellow man? So there's a couple of things about pride here that we need to understand. Number one is this, pride wants people to see how important we are. Pride wants people to see how important we are. Uh, in a book, I actually read this story. It happened during the Gulf War back in the 90s. And uh, one of the soldiers was promoted to the uh, rank of colonel. 
and he was given this new office. And so uh, he's, he's rearranging his office when there's a knock on the door. And, and to appear important, he picks up the phone and, and he says, come on in. And when the, the soldier comes on in, he starts talking as if he's talking to General Norman Schwarzkopf. And he says, yes, General. Yes, General Schwarzkopf. Thank you for consulting me about this issue, General Schwarzkopf. Norm, I really appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. And he hangs up the phone and he looks at the soldier and says, how can I help you? The man said, I'm just here to install the phone. <laughs> That's what the story is all about. Jesus is saying that if you promote yourself, there's going to be a fall. Pride comes before a fall, a haughty spirit before destruction. And, and the thing is, is, is that I hope for most of us the fall comes here, because if it doesn't, it will come eventually in this world. You see, pride wants people to see how smart we are. That, that's what the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees were trying to catch Jesus. They were actually trying to use the Old Testament scripture and to bust Jesus. They were using the, the Bible as ammunition, not as nutrition. See, when we quote scriptures to our brothers and our sisters, it's not to beat them over the head. The Bible should never be used as a club. It should be used as food. It's something that we offer spiritually to build, to encourage, to lift people up. Number three, pride focuses on how everything ultimately affects me. Pride is, is selfish. Pride is all about me, 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 and me. A little five-year-old boy, he was uh, to be the ring bearer in a wedding. And uh, it was the rehearsal the night before. And he's going down the middle aisle and he's rolling down the aisle. And, and the ring goes flying and, and the pillow is getting beat up. And, and uh, he's misbehaving. And finally, Grandma comes up with this genius idea. She goes on over to the little boy and she says, uh, Tommy, I just want you to know that I'm actually given a prize for whoever performs the best at the wedding tomorrow. And all of a sudden, Tommy stands up straight and he picks up the, the ring and he gets it on the pillow and, and he performs perfectly that evening. The next day, the wedding starts and sure enough, he comes out in his little tux and his shoes are all polished and he walks straight down the aisle. And when it's his turn, he, he unties the, the ring and he brings it to the best man and, and he performs perfectly. Grandma comes up to him after the service and said, said uh, you win the prize. You did the best job. And the boy goes, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And he goes, I was scared, though, when Aunt Donna came down the middle aisle in that big white dress and the trumpet started sounding. But I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. What was he doing? He was focused on himself. Inherently, that's who we all are. We learn as we get older to share our lives, to share our stuff, to behave. But when it comes to hospitality, a lot of times we go, you know what? I'm not going to invite anyone over because it's inconvenient for me. I'm not going to invite anybody over because I, I'm too busy. I'm not going to invite anybody over because it's too scary for me. I don't know what they'll think. I don't know how they'll judge my house. I'm not going to invite anybody over because my home is my castle. But the Bible tells us that God's our castle. God's our refuge. That, that God has given you that home. Whether it is an apartment of 800 square feet, a house of, of 2,800 square feet, He has given it to you as a tool to show the love of God to a lost and a dying world. Can I please get an amen? Thank you. I needed it right there just so you know. Number four, pride only wants to be involved in big things. Verses 12 and 13 talk about if you're invited to, uh, or if you're going to invite someone to a luncheon, a dinner, or a banquet. And a lot of us are willing to do the big things, the banquets, because we're going to be recognized for that. But there are some who don't want to do lunches because they're only going to impact one person's life. And if I only impact one person's life, is that really an effective use of my time? Most of us are familiar with Ray Kroc. Uh, he is the McDonald's guy who made billions and billions of dollars selling hamburgers. Uh, and his wife, Joan, 
uh, probably over a decade ago, gave the Salvation Army $1.6 billion. And uh, so they were interviewing her, and they said, uh, why in the world did you give the Salvation Army $1.6 billion? Is it because of all of the great work they do across the world? Is it because of their feeding programs? Is it because of their clothing programs? And, and she said, well, not really about any of that stuff. They said, well, wh what's it about? And she said, well, she said, when I was a little girl back in the 30s, there was a depression going on. And I grew up in a, in a single parent home. And we didn't have a, enough food most of the time. And, and some guy from the Salvation Army would come on over to the house. And about a, on a weekly basis, he would bring us a bag of groceries. And while mom was putting the groceries away, this, this man would actually play games with me and talk to me. And that's why I gave the Salvation Army $1.6 billion. And they said, well, what's the man's name? And she said, to be honest, I don't even remember his name. I think we have a choice to make. We can be a, a nameless person that makes a far bigger impact than we could ever imagine and gets our reward in heaven someday, or we can let everyone know what it is that we're doing and maybe not make the impact that this person did. See, pride wants to be paid back. One of the reasons we don't want to do little things or we don't want to do things for the poor is we know there's nothing they can do for us. But Jesus says that is actually better. That's one of the reasons why we as a church are going to be doing this Convoy of Hope event on November the 23rd. Because on November the 23rd, we're going to give away $1 million in goods and services. We're going to give away hundreds of thousands of dollars just in food supplies to the working poor right here in San Jose. And, and I think it's really biblical that the scripture here says you, you, you don't want to give to someone who can give it back to you. You want to give to someone who can't give it back to you. At Convoy of Hope, they're not going to be able to give it back to us. But listen, listen, listen. That's because what we're communicating is we value eternity more than this life. We value stewardship more than comfort. We value all human beings, not just the ones like us. Amen? Third and finally, Jesus challenges us to open up the table to everybody. He encourages us to expand our guest list. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus is not against you going over to your family and friends' homes. He's not against you having, you know, 30th birthday parties and all of those kinds of things. Those things are perfectly acceptable. Jesus went to his friends' houses on a regular basis. Jesus just expects his followers to do more than just ladle out soup to the poor once a year. He wants us to ladle out love all year long. To actually share our lives, our stuff, maybe even our homes. He invites the uninvited. Do not forget from last week that philozenia or hospitality in the Greek means, means love for strangers, love for foreigners, love for the immigrants. God includes all of the unworthy in his invitation to get people into heaven. He says, I want the crippled, I want the lame, I want the poor, I want the blind. Who, who is that practically speaking in our community? It's foster kids. We're a part of the Royal Family Kids Camp family. And we serve, I don't know, somewhere around 15, 20, maybe, maybe 25 foster children. As a church, I think we could do more. I think we could, we could serve 30, 40, 50 children. And you say, well, what does that entail? It entails one week out of the year. If you want to be a mentor, maybe one day a month. Kind of like a big brother, big sister kind of thing. But for kids who are in foster care, you would make an enormous difference in their life. Teen Challenge. It's a ministry that we support on a regular basis. We give our money, but they need more than our money. They need our time. They need our hearts. They need our invitations. 
We should call down there and say, hey, is, is there someone that we could take out for lunch this afternoon? Is, is there someone that we can have a, a meal with and invite them over for dinner, maybe two or three, and, and just let them know that we're praying for them, that we're believing in them, that, that together we're going to support them and trust that God's going to deliver them from drugs and alcohol in the name of Jesus Christ. We can do that. A next door neighbor who's lost all hope, someone at school or work who, who's gone through something traumatic in their lives. There are other spiritual seekers, people that are just looking for, for an answer. They, they, they know they're looking for something, but they're not even sure what it is. And they don't want to hear necessarily a Bible lesson. They want, they want someone like you to shake their hand, to embrace them before you offer them truth. Why? God himself identifies with the outsider. Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. Jesus is so welcoming. Do you, do you understand that he welcomes the unwelcomed? And I'm talking about those people who are most hated in society. Now, I don't know who that is in our culture today, but in Jesus' culture, it was the tax collector. Everybody hated the tax collectors because the tax collectors in Jerusalem were actually Jewish people who collected taxes from their own people and sent the money to Rome. And then they would charge like a surcharge. And, and they could charge any surcharge they wanted. And so they were hated, they were despised, they were despicable. They, they, they were the lowest of the low. In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You know what that means, right? Who you sit down and eat with, oftentimes you're identified with. Jesus didn't just welcome them as a host. He was excited to see them. He called them friends. He spent a majority of his time with them. He showed them genuine goodwill. He sat down not with, just with the hated, with, with the enemies. I mean, the Pharisees were the ones trying to kill him, and he would eat with them. Judas betrayed him, and he ate with him. Children. We see children a little different nowadays, but they didn't back then. Back, back then, children were nothing more than furniture. They were property. They could, they could do anything they wanted with their kids. And the disciples actually tried to shoo the kids away. And, and Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. Forbid them not. This is all kind of risky, just so you know. I mean, Robin and I, we've, in, we've had so many people in our homes over the years. Uh, we've let relatives stay in our house longer than we wanted them to stay. They would ruin things, destroy stuff. We taught something called Bible quiz for 15 years, and, and we would ask kids to memorize vast quantities of Scripture. And, and so what we would do is we'd have sleepovers at, over at our house, and, and then uh, that would be a Friday night, and we would study like until midnight. And then we'd get up at 4 in the morning and drive all the way to Southern California for a Bible quiz meet. And, and, and then sometimes we'd get on an airplane and fly to, to Dallas, Texas for a, a Bible quiz meet. And, and Robin and I would spend our own money feeding them flying them sometimes, getting them to where they need to go. And you might say, yeah, but pastor, th those were the upper crust kids. Sometimes. Others weren't so upper crust. One was arrested for stealing a car. One eventually was arrested for murdering somebody. Yeah, you don't know where my church was in Las Vegas. It was in a rough neighborhood. And the risks that we took didn't always pay off. Things were stolen from my home. Things were broken in my house. But we were willing to be vulnerable. We were willing to be hospitable because some of those same kids have grown up and become youth pastors, children's pastors, missionaries. Some of them have become leading men and women in the community, in the business world. Some become lawyers. I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing, just so you know. 
just teasing. Would you stand with me, please? We're all so different, every single one of us. And the last thing in the world that I want to do as your pastor is to make anyone feel guilty. This message isn't about guilt. This message is about how much God loves you. And he loves you so much that he wants to infuse your life with that very love so that you can show it towards other people. And if you're not at that place yet, pray. If if you're thinking these are wild and crazy ideas, start with a simple lunch with somebody at, at Subway. Take one step at a time. God is patient with each and every one of us. But I can tell you one thing for sure. If Bethel catches the vision of really being a friend of, of, of people who don't know Jesus Christ, we will fill this place up in the name of Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the hospitality you showed towards me. I'm appreciative of the invitation you gave me to come and feast at your table. And Lord, I, I, I'm just getting familiar with the spiritual food that is available to me. I know there is so much more as to probably most of us here. So, so I pray, Father God, that you would continue to fill us up spiritually speaking in the name of Jesus Christ. That you'd help us to experience your forgiveness, your grace, your mercy, your love, Father God, in unprecedented levels. And as we begin to sense you and your spirit in our lives, help us to give it away. Help us to give it away to our neighborhoods. Help us to give it away to this Silicon Valley. Help us to give it away to our schools and the businesses in which we work. Help us to give it away to our family and our friends, Father God. Help us to give it away even to the cranky neighbor to the right or to the left. Help us to continually be like Jesus and give this abundant life away every day, I pray. In Jesus' holy and precious name. And together everyone says...